Welcome to Second Recapped. At the beginning of the movie, climate change has ruined the world beyond repair by the year 2067. All plant life has died out. The amount of oxygen in the air has reduced drastically due to the lack of plant life. To survive, people must purchase artificial oxygen. The majority of the world has gone black. People die from suffocation. Only one city in Australia has survived in such conditions, and it is all because to the Chronicorp Corporation, which creates synthetic oxygen. Artificial oxygen, on the other hand, causes a lethal condition known as the sickness over time. Humanity is only a few years before it becomes extinct. Ethan White lives in the Australian city. In the Chronicorp Corporation, he and his pal Jude work as mechanics. In addition, the business is working around the clock to find a treatment for the sickness and a way to preserve the globe. Xanna, Ethan's wife, is likewise afflicted. Ethan works tirelessly day and night to earn and purchase better oxygen for her. Regina Jackson, the Chronocorp's CTO of Particle Research, summons Ethan and Jude to her office one day as they are working in the tunnel. She introduces herself to the two and informs them that humanity would perish in a few years if nothing were done to remedy the situation. She then discloses that Ethan is the only person capable of assisting everyone and saving humanity. Ethan is perplexed and does not believe her. Regina, on the other hand, demands that he come to their lab. The lab is equipped with massive machinery. Billy Mitchell, the lab doctor, introduces himself to Ethan and takes a brief look at Ethan's wrist gadget. They then tell him that this experiment was launched by Ethan's father, Dr. Richard White, 20 years ago. The equipment in front of them is a time machine known as the Chronicle. In the machine's first experiment, they had to transmit radio waves into it to see what was on the other side. They discovered through it that 407 years later, the world would have enough vegetation in 2474 to keep enough oxygen in the air and sustain human life. People tend to believe that if humanity survives several hundred years, it is likely that they have solved all the problems that plague their world. An odd action, however, perplexed the experts present. The waves they sent back had regrouped. They decrypted it and discovered that someone from the future had sent them the message send Ethan White. So, Regina and the rest of the team want to send Ethan into the future and have him bring back the cure. Ethan is taken aback. He doesn't believe them and believes Regina is bluffing. Moreover, as a result, he declines to assist. Later, Ethan and Jude visit a cafe and purchase crisp oxygen. Jude tries to persuade Ethan to carry out the plan and preserve humanity. Ethan, on the other hand, laughs at him and says he doesn't want to be like his father. Ethan despises his father since he is never there for him. His father went missing 20 years ago, and his mother was murdered when he was a child. Since then, he has been raised by Jude, whom Ethan views as both his older brother and best friend. He accuses him of abandoning his mother to finish the project. Ethan recalls his eighth birthday, when his father gave him an odd box as a gift. A device clamps onto his wrist as he puts his hands inside the box, causing him to bleed. Richard had fitted his youngster with a permanent hand gadget. It has been several years, yet Ethan is still unaware of its purpose. Later at home, Ethan informs Xanda about all that happened during the day, and she, too, insists on him leaving. Ethan writes I will find my way back to you on a metal flower and leaves it alongside Xanda the next morning. He then returns to Regina's office and informs her that if he can just find one treatment, they will have to give it first to Xanda. Regina accepts and takes him to the lab again. Dr. Mitchell shows him the suit that he has to wear before getting into the machine. As they begin to explain the mission to him, Ethan realizes that they do not have a plan. They have no clue what he will see, or who he will meet at the other end. However, after they put him in the suit, they give him an AI device called the Archie. Archie will always show the lab Ethan's vitals, it will also help to navigate his location. Then, they finally throw him into the machine. Inside, Ethan moves at high speed through time. He falls from the sky and lands in an unknown jungle. The friction from the air causes his suit to catch fire, so he quickly gets out of it. Then, he looks around, and is astounded by the beauty of nature. He finds that the world has completely changed. The trees and the natural oxygen are back. He walks in the direction Archie directs him and sees a bunker door of some sort. But what catches his eyes is a skeleton that lies right in front of the door. Its skull has a bullet hole in it. Furthermore, he looks at the name tag on it and is horrified to see his own name. 
the skeleton is Ethan's. Ethan also finds the skeleton's Archie and plays the last recording on it. He hears a man say that this is the only way, and shoots Ethan. Just then, the device's power goes off. He is horrified, believing that this is the fate that awaits him. Then, he notices the skeleton's wrist device. It is identical to Ethan's, except the light glows green in the skeleton's device, but Ethan's has been red his whole life. That night, he lights a fire and eats wild berries. It turns out that the berries were poisonous. Ethan vomits and starts to go unconscious. Ethan wakes up after a while and is surprised to see Jude in front of him. As it turns out, the lab saw Ethan's vitals dropping and assumed he was having a reaction to poison. So, they quickly sent Jude to the future, with the cure to save him. Sometime later, Ethan and Jude find that his skeleton remains there, which means his fate hasn't changed. They then use Archie to find another door. Some device scans Ethan's eye and grants them access. When they go in, a monitor welcomes him. It asks him for a DNA sample. When he accepts it, his wrist device begins to work, making him bleed. After the blood test, it goes green. The lights to the room turn on and they realize that they are in Chronocorp's lab, 407 years later. The time machine is in front of them too. Jude gets excited because now they have the means to go back to the past, but Ethan doesn't think so, saying they haven't changed anything, and he will end up dead, just like the dead Ethan. Ethan checks the system log and finds a holographic recording made by his father, who explains that the time machine was originally designed to collect the oxygen data in the future planet, and then transmit it back to the past. However, when his father first started the time machine, he received a message asking him to send his son to the future. Despite his misgivings, he chose to do so and made a DNA verification here for Ethan. Soon, Ethan and Jude realize that the time machine won't be able to take them back because its battery has almost depleted after 407 years. What's worse is that the activation of the lab triggers a malfunction in its nuclear power core, threatening to unleash a nuclear explosion in just four hours. This means they must find a way to fix the time machine and travel back before the explosion. Running out of time, they must act quickly. Outside, they are surprised to find a ruined city covered with green plants, but inhabited with no humans, showing that Earth starts to recover itself after human extinction. Human skeletons are scattered everywhere. Ethan gets to his wife's house, only to find her bones, making him fall into despair. Jude tries to persuade him to go back to the past, as the cure against the sickness doesn't seem to exist even in the future world. However, Jude's words make Ethan suspicious. He then turns on the rusty Archie to play the recording once again, from which he recognizes Jude's voice, and it seems Jude is exactly the one who shot him. Jude raises his gun at Ethan, strongly denying that he would shoot Ethan. Ethan finally decides to complete the mission first, so with joint efforts, they manage to repair the power core and then return to the lab. Now the Chronicle system works, and they should be able to return to the past, they just need to wait 37 minutes till portal launch. Once the countdown reaches zero, the portal will tether to 2067 for approximately 30 seconds. However, Ethan still finds his body remains behind a door at the same location, which implies that they haven't made any changes to the future. To figure out the truth, Ethan pulls out the battery of his current Archie and puts it onto the rusty one. In that way, he gets access to another video, in which Ethan is assured that his future self will be killed by Jude. Jude then confesses that there is no hope of changing the future and he is trying to protect Ethan. Finding it hard to believe, Ethan locks his brother up in a room, then plays back his father's holographic log from the day he died. He soon discovers a conversation between the Chronocorp's CTO, Regina Jackson, and his father. It's shown that Ethan's father wanted to use the time machine to save all mankind by finding the cure, but the CTO only intended to use the machine to flee from the dying time with some chosen few. However, whichever plan they choose, someone must travel into the future and turn on the time machine, to safely send living matter through time, it requires an operational link from both sides in order to stop the CTO with her plan, his father locks the time machine and sets Ethan's DNA as the verification key. In anger at what Ethan's father just did, the CTO killed him immediately. She then orders Jude to kill Ethan's mother and be a guardian to him, so one day they can use Ethan's wristband to get access to the future. Ethan is beyond surprised. The man he thought of as his brother, turned out to be the one who killed his mother and is about to kill him too. 
he also realizes that he has misunderstood his father, who didn't deliberately abandon the family. Knowing Regina wants to send a select few into the future, Ethan tries to shut off the time machine, but Jude intervenes and reveals that he's been sent here by the CTO to guarantee that Ethan is transported in time to correct the power outage. He should kill Ethan once the time machine is activated. Jude, on the other hand, has developed strong emotional bonds with Ethan throughout the years. He feels guilty seeing his brother-like friend in such position do of him. So, rather than shooting Ethan, he shoots himself. Ethan is driven by fury and guilt to satisfy his father's dying wish, to discover a cure and save the dying people. He glances at the display and discovers his father's very first message. He comes to the conclusion that the message sent Ethan White was sent by himself. As a result, he codes in the message again and sends it back in time, along with numerous other things. Meanwhile, in the year 2067, the CTO and a group of elite's chosen people are nervously awaiting the activation of the time machine. To their surprise, the time machine returns hundreds of extinct plants as well as a copy of Ethan's father's recorded murder. Soon later, Ethan destroys the time machine, resulting in the failure of the CTO's plot. Finally, the CTO is arrested for the murder. The plants returned to 2067 are being cultivated in order to revitalize the planet. Ethan's wife receives a bouquet from him and understands his decision. While Ethan must remain alone in the future world, he buries Jude and forgives him. A butterfly captures his attention and takes him back to the same door, where Ethan is relieved to see that his future self's corpse has vanished. He runs outside to look around, relieved to see a futuristic eco-friendly metropolis in contrast to the deserted one from earlier. His decision had altered the course of human history. Subscribe for more videos like this, turn on notifications, and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.